Uh, the committee will come to order. I I'd like to uh, thank the witnesses for remaining, and I I'd, I'd like to uh, begin asking, uh, by asking Mr. Cannon. Uh, Under what circumstances do you see that um, um, that making private health insurance compulsory represents a bailout to the insurance industry? How do you could you explain that view? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and hold the mic a little bit close, okay? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. In order to help Americans comply with what they call the individual mandate in the legislation before the House, and the, there's one in the legislation before the Senate as well. Congress uh, has decided it would, ha or the legislation would offer subsidies to Americans to help them purchase health insurance. Simply mandating that people purchase health insurance doesn't mean that they'll be able to. Uh, a lot of people won't be able to, inf to afford it. Uh, and so Congress would be, in this legislation, offering subsidies to a lot of people who ca cannot afford health insurance on their own and to a lot of people who can afford health insurance on their own because the subsidies, as I understand them, would go up to um, 300 or 400 percent of the federal poverty level, which for a family of four is somewhere around sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 uh, per year. Um, those subsidies offered to people who can afford health insurance already and to people who cannot uh, would, would uh, essentially help people purchase more health insurance and, uh, and, and uh, ex give the insurance industry really a guaranteed customer base uh, and a guaranteed source of revenue. Uh, so I think that uh, essentially what, the, what that legislation would do was, uh, is, is um, akin to uh, a bailout of, of the health insurance industry. I don't think that what we should be doing is, is giving more uh, to, this, uh, to this sector or, the, or, or to this industry. I think we should be demanding more from it. And I think the way to do that is, is to preserve the choose uh, whether or not to purchase health insurance as well as the freedom to choose what goes into your health insurance policy. And the way to do that, in my view, is to let consumers control the money that government and employers now control to purchase health insurance on their behalf. And they will uh, they will economize on on health insurance. They will um, they will purchase uh, most likely purchase less health insurance than they do right now, um, and they will hold health insurers accountable uh, in a way that they cannot when their employers are making those decisions for them. So let's uh, let's go f four years down the road. Let's say that a health care plan is enacted, which requires that people. Uh, have uh, private insurance. Let's say there's no public option. That's kind of the way it looks like right now. And um, people, there will be tens of millions of Americans who will be faced with a decision to either purchase the private insurance or pay a fine. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to comment on that? I think that uh, what that really highlights is that this uh, proposal for uh, to mandate people purchase health insurance, this proposal for, to make health insurance compulsory in the United States amounts to a tax on a lot of uh, middle class families. If they uh, purchase the health insurance, as uh, President Obama's economic advisor Larry Summers acknowledges, when the government forces people to purchase something that they don't value or pay more than the market would demand, that is in itself a tax. But if they don't purchase uh, the mandatory level of coverage and they have to pay what uh, we euphemistically call a fine or a penalty, that is, that's, that's a tax as well. And in the House legislation, there would be a tax on the individual equal to 2.5 percent of, of income, of adjusted gross income. And if the individual's employer does not offer them coverage, there would be a tax equal to 8 percent of payroll. Now, uh, Mr. Summers and the Congressional Budget Office and uh, economists broadly acknowledge that that 8 percent uh, payroll tax would be paid for by the worker because it would reduce her earnings. So what you're talking about there is a 10.5 percent uh, tax is that, on is the that uninsured. A, is that axiomatic? It is. So you're saying that if workers have a health care benefit, uh, they're in effect paying for it? Absolutely. And I, I think, in fact, that is why, uh, that, I think that's the great um, uh, uh, the biggest drawback or the biggest problem with the tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance. The quote-unquote employer contribution to the average family plan in this country uh, amounts to $10,000. Uh, 
that's $10,000 of the worker's earnings that the worker doesn't get to control. The government, by creating this tax for employer-sponsored insurance, essentially ta takes that $10,000 out of the worker's hands, gives it to the employer, and lets the employer make the worker's uh, health insurance de decisions for the worker. So, so yes, I think that uh, economists, in fact, there's a survey of, of health economists recently, and the uh, broadest area of agreement was on the question of whether uh, health benefits actually come out of uh, wages or, or, or profits or something else. They, uh, Ninety percent of economists, health economists acknowledged or agreed with the proposition that, yes, workers pay for those health benefits through reduced wages. As Thank well you. as, and the same is true of any tax penalties that Congress might impose. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Uh, Professor Pollitz. Uh, I want to speak to you about how government can help the public make better choices about health insurance. In, in uh, your testimony, you pointed out something that many people may not realize, and I quote, the primary purpose of health insurance data collected by state regulators today is to monitor the solvency of private health insurers and that, quote, enforcement of consumer protections in health insurance today is largely triggered by complaints. Uh, I think the average person is or would be surprised to hear this. So who does monitor things like accessibility, affordability, or security of private health insurers? or how accurately or fully they pay out on claims? Um, it's not, it is not well monitored or consistently monitored today. I think state insurance regulators strive mightily to protect consumers as best they can. Their resources are limited. Would you describe the state regulators as reactive to consumer complaints rather than proactive? Um, a lot of it is reactive, oftentimes in response to a complaint. Um, even as, as little as one complaint, a state regulator may uh, initiate a broader investigation of a company or of a pattern of practices. So I don't mean to suggest that state regulators aren't out there giving it their best effort, but um, they are uh, very strapped in terms of resources. They are very uh, broad in terms of the jurisdiction that they need to keep an eye on. And with limited resources, I mean, if I were one and I had the limited resources, I would probably start with solvency myself because if a company goes under, then no claims will be paid for anybody. So that's not an illogical place to start, but there are not enough resources to monitor closely what needs to be monitored. And with health insurance, that's a very transaction-heavy um, uh, task to, to accomplish. Do, uh, do private health insurers themselves keep data on complaints made against them uh, that can be reviewed? That can be reviewed? Yeah. Uh, huh. um, I don't actually know what data they would keep. All insurance companies have a compliance office with a lot of attorneys, and I'm sure they at, at least have a pretty good idea um, of what complaints are being filed. And they have to keep records. I mean, this is why you get urged to put everything in writing when you're, uh, course, but when you're communicating with your insurance company so that there will be a record somewhere. Okay, my, my time's expired. I'm going to go to my colleague for five minutes, and then we'll go uh, to one more and fin uh, one uh, final round of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cannon and, and Ms. Poltz, thank you for, for being here. Uh, Mr. Cannon, let, let me ask you about uh, this idea of interstate uh, insurance, broadening the, the field, increasing the market, increasing competition. In, in the first panel, the, there were, I believe Dr. Pino and Mr. Potter talked about the cartel that exists in the insurance market right now. Uh, their solution was to have the government compete. That's, you know, the increased competition by having this so-called public option. The, the approach I prefer is this interstate um, market. Uh, tell me your thoughts on that, uh, what the research shows. It's getting, this, this is, you know, now being debated a lot and talked about as a possible improvement. Um, let, let, me, let, let me hear your, your thoughts there. Well, I think that uh, the insurance markets in most states are not unlike a cartel. And I think the reason is that is because each state um, sets up barriers to competition uh, to protect their domestic insurers. What, the, what those are are essentially state licensing laws. Now, there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with uh, uh, a state licensing law per se, but what these laws do is they say, unless your uh, insurance policy is licensed by this state, say the Commonwealth of Virginia, then you may not sell it to residents of this state. 
And so what that means is that residents of Virginia cannot purchase a health insurance policy that's available in Maryland or in right. North Carolina. Uh, that's particularly cruel, I think, to residents of, say, uh, New Jersey, who face some of the highest health insurance premiums in the country. Uh, they cannot purchase health insurance from uh, across the Delaware River in Pennsylvania, where it's often less expensive. Uh, so what happens, so, so I do think there is insufficient competition in insurance markets. The President uh, and, and other supporters of a, of a new government program have said that they can, that, that a new competitor can keep insurance companies honest. If that's the case, and I think that dozens of new competitors would do an even better job, right. so that if Congress, using its power under the Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution, were to say, look, you know, states can license health insurance, but they cannot prohibit their residents from purchasing health insurance licensed by another state. What that would do is it would uh, bring new entrants into the, the markets in each state, give individuals and empl employers a lot more choices uh, of health insurance plans and, and, and increase competition. What it would also do it was, is it would give individuals and employers the power to avoid unwanted, costly state regulations. Uh, a lot of state regulations are, in fact, consumer protections. Solvency standards that uh, Ms. Pollitz was talking about are, are, I think, a prime example. But when you start uh, looking at how the states require consumers to purchase 40 different types of mandated benefits that they right. may not want or need, or try to impose hidden taxes on the healthy right. uh, in order to subsidize That's the sick. That's where savings can take place, sure. Those, those are, uh, increase, those are uh, uh, regulations that increase the cost of insurance and make it unaffordable for some people. So you can't really call them consumer protections if they're keeping people from purchasing health insurance. And I think that letting people purchase insurance across state lines would allow people to. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paul. The proposals to allow sale across state lines that have been in the Congress to date um, are really a prescription for insurance fraud. There would be um, little practical ability of the licensing state to regulate insurance sold across the 50 states. Imagine if the Ohio commissioner had to keep track of policies that were sold in California and Texas and mm -hmm. New York. They're not set up for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the notion of escaping uh, mandated benefits is a total red herring. The reason that health insurance costs more in New Jersey compared to Maryland, where I live, um, which has been cited as the champion of mandated benefits. Supposedly, we have more in Maryland than anywhere. Um, is that in New Jersey, uh, everybody has to be offered health insurance. You can't be turned down because you have cancer. And in Maryland, you can. So it's cheaper. And insurance Mr. will Cannon always... Mr. talked a lot the, about that in his last and in the, previous question. I, I think we have to come back to what is the basis of competition in health insurance right mm -hmm. now. And it is competition to avoid sick people and their costs. And the more you dilute um, oversight and regulation, the more easy that will be and the more consumers will be at risk. A, a response from Mr. Cannon. Um, uh, uh, Karen raises a couple of important issues. Uh, one of them is how do you enforce these rules uh, that are written by an out-of-state um, um, legislature or, or insurance right. commissioner? And I think there's a fairly straightforward way of doing that. You have those regulations, whatever they may be, incorporated in the insurance contract, which could then be enforced in the purchaser's home state and in their courts. So. Uh, and, and, then, and then the domestic, uh, the, the, the purchaser's insurance commissioner could even play a role there. What's important is, is that the individual consumer uh, or the employer be able to choose the rules and uh, they could be uh, enforced at home without having to rely on an out-of-state insurance commissioner. As for uh, the cost of mandated benefits, the, the cost estimates vary, but the Commonwealth of Massachusetts recently estimated that the uh, benefits that are mandated in that state add 12% uh, percent to the cost of premium. So that's right. a substantial chunk of money. Sure, sure. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, it looks like just you and me. I yield back to you. Just you and me. I this town is big enough for both of us. Um, I'd like to go back to Ms. Pollitz. I'd like to talk to you about standards of care and, uh, and a possible scenario. Are, are you aware of any data on the is inconsistent application of standards of care by private insurers? Is it possible that within two, uh, uh, taking two different people, with the same illness, who are insured by the same private health insurer, that they'll be treated differently by the insurance company. Is that possible? I believe it's possible, yes. And so is there any guarantee that if a person buys coverage, it will guarantee coverage? 
Um, not an ironclad guarantee, no. Pardon? Not an ironclad guarantee, no. There is a contract, but it, it, it's very hard. But there's no hard. guarantees. That's correct. Uh, I'd like to ask you about lack of transparency in private health insurance uh, as compared to Medicare. Uh, Congress and the general public are able to examine and debate the reasoning behind how Medicare pays for medical care, but the private health insurers keep their decision-making process and guidelines hidden behind uh, thick books of confusing terminology. In other words, Medicare's actions are transparent, but private insurers are not, uh, but they provide the same service ostensibly to cover medical expenses. Now, is there any justification to keeping insurance company definitions of medical necessity proprietary? I don't think so, no. And why would the insurance company want to keep that information pr pr proprietary? I believe they'll argue so that uh, doctors and other providers don't try to game the system and sort of code their billing so that, you know, it, it matches up what the um, you know, what the guidelines would be. But um, um, I think you heard testimony on the earlier panel that there is also an effort to just, you know, kind of try to hide the ball and try to, you know, create options for the insurance company to deny claims if they feel like they want to do that. Uh, are, there, uh, are there any data nationally about either the frequency of wrongful denials of claims or of unjustified reviews or appeals? Um, there are not good consistent data. Um, I tried a couple of years ago to study the results of even external appeals programs, and the data are very sparse. Um, what you can find is uh, suggests that we need to be doing a better job um, and looking much more carefully and not relying on this sort of end result of a patient having to go through all of the, um, all of the steps and appeals um, uh, you know, before they can get to a system where records will be kept. Um, anything else you wanted to add about that uh, uh, that you haven't told this committee about the uh, data collection? Um, I, I really do think, Mr. Chairman, that we need to think carefully about the ways that insurance companies compete now to avoid paying claims. Um, uh, certainly there are reasons why, you know, we don't want to pay for care that's not medically necessary. We don't want to pay for fraud. I mean, there, we, there are reasons for vigilance for sure. Um, but I think we need to think from the patient's perspective about what we need to track um, so that we can make sure that decisions are justified, that they're backed up, that they're consistent, and that they're in the patient's best interests and then build our data reporting requirements from that exercise. I think we need a much more proactive and pro-patient approach to data gathering from health insurance companies, and I hope that will be a central part of any health reform legislation that gets enacted. Um, I would, I'd like to ask a, um, A question of Mr. Cannon. Uh, you're here representing the Cato Institute, and uh, I've always found very handy this uh, Constitution of the United States, which comes from the Cato Institute, including its um, its introduction. Uh, I under our Constitution, you know, the General Welfare Clause, which there's been a lot of discussion about. Uh, there, there are some of us who believe that both the preamble to the Constitution and Article I, Section 8, and describing the general welfare, uh, that as we evolve as a nation and have specified health care, retirement security as part of the general welfare, that uh, an, a logical extension of that would be to have health care uh, for all guided by the principle of uh, enunciated in the Constitution, both in Article I, Section 8, and the preamble. Uh, what, you know, tell me what you, how you see that. The, the question is about the general welfare uh, clause right. of the Constitution. Uh, there is a difference of opinion uh, uh, among legal scholars about what that means. I'm not a constitutional scholar, but let me give you my, my best take on, on what that uh, on what that disagreement is. Uh, there are some that read that uh, as an expansive grant of power that would say give Congress 
the power to the constitutional authority to uh, enact, say, a single payer system or uh, ma make health insurance compulsory for all Americans. I think that uh, the perspective of uh, Cato's constitutional scholars is that uh, if that were true, if the uh, uh, if the framers of the Constitution meant for the general welfare clause to be su such a sweeping, broad, comprehensive grant of power from the states to the federal government, then the rest of the Constitution would, you know, would, would be superfluous. They wouldn't have had to enumerate all the other powers in the Constitution because the general welfare, welfare clause would have taken care of everything. So the very structure of the Constitution itself, I think, argues against a broad uh, or the sort of expansive interpretation of the general welfare clause that you suggest. Well, one of the things that um, uh, that I've always been impressed with is the preamble which Cato provides to the uh, uh, Declaration and the Constitution. And, and one of the things they say in there, uh, my, my colleague, is that uh, it's, not, it's not political will but moral reasoning which is the, uh, the foundation of the political system. And the, the the, some of the issues that are being brought to us about conditions relating to health care in America are laden with, with moral consequences and moral overtones. And there's like an underlying reality of whether health care, if health care is a privilege based on ability to pay, or is health care a fundamental right in a democratic society, there's like this arc where you go from... Um, uh, from economics, which can be amoral, to um, the imperatives of a democracy that relate directly to morality. And, and I just, I, you know, I th that's a, that's in, in a way, that's part of the backdrop of this national discussion we're having right now. Is it a, is it a right or is it a privilege? Um, you know, and this, this is part of our unfolding democracy here, trying to dissolve those, try, trying to decipher the, what the meaning of this document is, and also doing it within the context of what our present day needs are and what the, and, and what the very human conditions we find ourselves in and the underlying morality of, you know, is it, is it immoral for somebody to be denied care even when they're paying for policy? You know, these are questions that we have to deal with here. I appreciate uh, having the chance to share that with you. Uh, Mr. Christian. Jordan, you can, you can uh, conclude this hearing. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just go to the, to the premise. Many of the witnesses in the first panel, the, the premise was the government can do it better. Um, you know, we, we know that there's been problems with the way insurance companies deal with, with patients and, and sometimes some of the things that take place. But this idea that, that, that government can do it better, I'd, I'd, I'd like your thoughts on that. In light of Congressional Research uh, Service said that over a billion claims are submitted uh, each year. Uh, to Medicare, <clears throat> 10 percent of those claims are denied. Attorney General Holder, I have a quote here, said, by all accounts, every year we lose tens of billions of dollars in Medicare and Medicaid funds to fraud. So your, your thoughts on if, you know, we met with health care professionals. We did uh, health care roundtables in our district uh, over the recess. And, um, you know, we had so many people tell us that, you know, government's already 50 percent of the health care market right now, and that um, providers don't get compensated fully for the care they provide when they, when they uh, treat folks in our Medicare and Medicaid system, and therefore the, the folks who are in the private insurance have to pay more to just, just, just the way the system set up right now. So I'd like both your thoughts. I'll start with Mr. Cannon uh, uh, on this, this premise that has is, is been so um, kind of underlies the, the entire hearing today on somehow that the government can do it better, because as, as you can gather, I have real reservations about that. Well, I, I think, Congressman, that uh, the state of America's health care sector right now is pretty good evidence that the government does not, not do a very good job of managing health care. And I'll give you a couple of examples. You brought up uh, the Medicare program. Um, it, that program uh, has, uh, it has been estimated that uh, one-third of Medicare spending to, does absolutely nothing to improve the health or, uh, uh, or improve, improve the health of patients or improve patient satisfaction, P provides no value to them whatsoever. Um, the, uh, it's often cited that we have, so that's an enormous amount of waste, uh, much even larger than the estimates of fraud in the Medicare program. Uh, 
it has been estimated that as many as 100,000 Americans die every year due to medical errors in hospitals. Mm -hmm. I submit that Medicare is probably the biggest reason for that because Medicare's payment system actually penalizes doctors and hospitals when they succeed in reducing medical errors. It makes it a losing business proposition. Um, rather than have competition between different payment systems that bring out different dimensions of, uh, that, that, that uh, would improve all dimensions of quality, uh, Medicare gives us uh, uh, good marks on some dimensions of quality, but absolutely horrible marks on, on other mm -hmm. dimensions. One of the uh, biggest problems that the President talks about uh, is uh, the problem of pre-existing conditions, people with high cost illnesses right. uh, who uh, lose their coverage and, and then cannot afford the, the premiums that uh, they're charged on the individual market. That is a problem that has been fueled by government for 60 years. And the reason is that uh, 60 years ago, the government created a tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance coverage that has given us the employer-based system that we have right now that is so cruel, and to use the chairman's words, immoral, that it takes insurance away from people at the moment they need it most, when they lose their jobs, they lose their incomes. And if those people are sick, then they've got a pre-existing well, condition. Issue, They're one, not going to be able to get coverage. And if I may finish, okay. well, one, of the, one, of the, one of the studies that I cite in my written testimony uh, finds it, uh, looks at looks at the empirical uh, looks at the data and and finds that people who purchase insurance directly from an insurance company people with high cost illnesses who do so are uh, half as likely to end up uninsured as people who purchase health uh, high cost uh, uh, patients who purchase health insurance from a small employer yeah one of the things we should do it's in, in the legislation I've co-sponsored is to for the family that has to go out and buy it on their own in the market they should get the same tax advantage that we give to employers who provide it to their employees and, and that problem has been in place for 60 yeah. years and now that's and, number and the one government my, has my, my yet number to correct one thing it. we have to do or one, one of the key things we have to do. Ms. Pollitt, you got to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no problem. I think the, um, I, I think the real difference, two real differences. Um, one is about accountability. And there is a different level of accountability for government than there is for the private sector. There just is. I think we should try to um, enhance and, and strengthen accountability in the private sector with much stronger oversight and regulation and enforcement regardless of how you end up structuring health reform. I think that's essential. Um, but the government programs will always be accountable in a different way um, to directly to the voters. They'll always be open in a different way compared to commercial plans. That's well, the way if, we've well, set up our government. I, mean, I think you get an argument from Mr. Cannon and, and, and many of us that you know a, a real marketplace, they're accountable directly to the consumer. Well, but that's so that's need, my, my second judgment, point. That's where we need to be headed is to a true marketplace. And that's my second point. A marketplace of competing insurance companies will always, always, in health insurance, compete to avoid sick people. That is the overpowering incentive. It beats everything, and it always will. Even in a more regulated marketplace, even in a more transparent place, you're always going to be trying to catch up with that. Introducing a public component to that, it's it's a it's kind of a funny notion. It's not like the government is going to compete to make more profits than Blue Cross um, or, or WellPoint. Um, it's that um, the no, government if, if, will be there offering a choice that isn't well, we, we motivated need to be clear by on this that. Point. If there's a public option, eventually the public option will dominate. I mean, it, even will even not be, Congressman did you say? even Congressman Frank has said that a public option will lead to a single payer okay. system. That I mean, that's. This idea that somehow it's not going to do that, I just I don't think flies. I think most Americans have already figured that out, and that's why they're concerned about this. But plan. Mr. Jordan, I was on the board for several years of a public program in my state where I live, our state high risk pool, mm -hmm. and it was administered by a private insurance company. And so you know they and they know how to administer claims, and that is definitely its own art and its own skill. Um, and as the consumer rep on the board, I would ask questions. Um, why do we have so many denials of pre-authorization, for example, for mental health services? That turned out to be one of the biggest services that any of our patients used, um, even though that wasn't the major diagnosis. It's very stressful to be sick. People need help. And one of our leading sources of complaints had to do with denials for mental health services. And so I said, why is that? Why are we denying all this care? Well, it turned out it was paperwork. People were supposed to jump through all these hoops and get pre-authorization. They had to do it within a certain number of days. And um, it, it was just a, a load of, of, of hoops that they had to jump through. And I said, well, OK, once they go through all these hoops, how many of them were actually denied? And we had thousands of denials. And they said seven. And I said, really? Then why are we doing this? Why are we making them jump through all these hoops? Oh, they said, this is saving you a lot of money. I said. 
I don't want you to save us a lot of money. We're here to pay for care. We're a high risk pool. They're sick. No one else will take care of them. This is our job. This is what the taxpayers have given us tax dollars to do. Let's stop doing that. We did that. I can't imagine that would happen in the company that Ms. Pino used to, Dr. Pino used to work for. That it's just a different incentive. It competes on a different way. And I think we need to create a different standard for covering health care. And if private insurance companies can't compete against that and survive, well, so what? I mean, we took care of the patients who were sick. And isn't that what this has to be about? Primarily, it, it seems to me that has to be where we start the discussion. Uh, we thank the uh, gentlelady. I want to thank Mr. Jordan for his participation in this hearing and uh, thank uh, both of the witnesses from the second panel for their participation. Uh, as my uh, friend is uh, leaving the room, I, I just wanted to comment, and staff can re relate this to him, that um, uh, some, there are some cases, I suppose, where a public option may lead to a single-payer system at some point. Um, I mean, I actually am the co-author of a bill to create a single-payer system, and I'd like to see a single-payer system. We have 85 members of the House who have signed on to a bill, H.R. 676, a bill I drafted with Mr. Conyers. But that, uh, th that bill, uh, in its uh, fullness, is not likely to have hearings. Uh, and. Uh, well, there might be a vote on it. Uh, it needs a movement behind it that doesn't, uh, that, that needs a little more strength. So while some public options may lead to single payer, uh, I would just like to offer the opinion that it's unlikely that the, that the current status of the public option that is uh, suggested in H.R. 3200 would lead to single payer. O has said in one of its studies that 9 million people uh, at, at most would be covered by, uh, uh, by any kind of a public option. Uh, that uh, the first iteration of that plan was to have 129 million people covered by it. So if you have 9 million people, uh, uh, that particular plan may not pose uh, much of a risk or actually, frankly, a competitive uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the uh, private insurers. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention that since we're talking about public options. You're much appreciated for the time that you've spent, for your patience, and uh, this committee uh, stands adjourned. I want to remind people that tomorrow we will hear from executives from six of the major health insurance companies so that we can uh, follow up and ask them some of the questions that were raised in today's hearing. We all um, are very appreciative of your presence. Uh, committee stands adjourned.